Hello friends, welcome back to another live stream with us. Today on The Future, we have Emily Cohen and she's gonna be sharing some truths, some things that are uncomfortable for us to hear, but I wanna encourage you to stick around for this because sometimes the medicine can be a little bitter, but it's good for you and you know that. And, and without saying too much, you wanna stick around because she's gonna talk about the bad behaviors that we as creatives exhibit that's actually hurting our, our industry. And once we come to that realization, maybe there's something that we can do about it. Okay, so guys, buckle up, hang in there. We're gonna get right into it. Join us, go to my deck. So Emily has this approach of saying, no BS, she's not going to be sugarcoating anything. And she's gonna be sharing with us business strategies for creative businesses. Yes, that makes sense. And if you don't know who Emily is, she's a professional business consultant and she's been doing this for over 30 years. Somebody who's been doing it longer than me. So I'm, I'm really excited. So there's gonna be a lot of knowledge, experience and wisdom in there. She's also an author instructor at lynda.com, now LinkedIn Learning. She wrote this book called Brutally Honest. And we're gonna talk a lot about that and she's gonna share, I think a 40 minute presentation that she's given elsewhere, but just customized just for us. So guys, you're in for a treat. She's a speaker. And if you're a conference organizer and you're looking for a dynamic speaker, a powerhouse speaker, you're gonna to wanna to reach out to her directly after this episode. And she teaches the business of design. Mm, somebody else who teaches the same thing that we do at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture in Philadelphia. She got her Bachelor's of Arts in Graphic Design at State University of New York, New York at Purchase. And this is the beautifully designed book that we're talking about. I have a copy here in the studio with me. Nine Pantone colors, Mohawk paper. I'm a little jealous at how good this book looks. And dare I say, I think it's better than ours, Jonah. <laughs> Dang. 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 So we, uh, we got to deal with this. But it also costs a fortune to make, and we're going to talk about that. And so here's her... Here's her stats, her digits, if you will. It's Emily Cohen. If you guys want to check her out right now, go to emilycohen.com. And on social, she's Emily Ruth Cohen. Everybody, please help me welcome Emily to the show. Yeah. Oh, hey. Emily. Hey, yeah, there we go. Thanks for having me, Chris. I'm really excited. Yes. And uh, this episode was kind of a long time in coming because we were exchanging yeah. information. And then at some point, it just made a lot of sense to have you on the show. Now, I must admit, I have not read the book. I've not. But God, guys, it's gorgeous. Look at yeah, this. Yeah. Pantone colors. Helve is it Helvetica? No. No, it looks like Helvetica, but it's not. What is it? Yeah. I, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> okay, let's just say it's kind of like Helvetica, but it's beautiful, oh, guys. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can get back to you on that okay. one. <laughs> I did not design it. <laughs> now, this book costs a small fortune. And maybe at some point when we have time, when I get into the book, what's inside of it, how much it costs, where you can get a copy. It retails for $38. You guys, I have it here. Beautiful matte cover. It can, you can, you can split it wide open. It's not going to tear the book apart. She spent a lot of money making this book, I think, to help people, right? Yeah. All right. Let's, um, do you want to talk about a couple things before we get into your deck? Sure, I'd love that. First of all, thanks again for having me. I'm really excited. I've heard lots of things about your show, and I've watched a bunch of episodes, and I was really excited. And we actually crossed uh, paths while we were both speaking at the AIJ. We just didn't get a chance to meet in person. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about this. Um, so I want to, this talk is specifically geared to creatives who are doing great things, and they're really practicing um, having really successful businesses. And but what they're doing is they're doing some practices and behaviors that are hurting our industry. And so I've decided this is my talk where I get to yell at you guys. Um, <laughs> are you gonna yell at me? <laughs> maybe not. Okay, maybe okay. we'll have some good arguments. I'll behave. I promise. Cool. I Sorry. like arguments because yeah. um, what I hear a lot from creatives, and I hear this a lot, is they blame the clients for everything. Yes. Oh my gosh. And and that sort of got me thinking about what what are we doing to you know just like when you have um, kids right yes. they might misbehave but it's up to you how you are managing them right I always joke about how many people have dogs and kids they need structure they need behavior you don't you know if you don't have certain structure and rules and and um, ways of behaving then they're going to misbehave and it's the same thing with clients and so I think we could do things to change our behavior so the clients are behaving better. Are you right. referring and to so, clients as, as like children and dogs? Just well, curious. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> managing clients is like managing kids and dogs. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Not cats. <laughs> you can't manage cats. No, you cannot manage cats. They crawl all over you. Yeah. Um, 
And I think there's a lot of reasons why people are misbehaving and doing things that are hurting themselves in the industry. And I think that's a lot because there was just so much, so much competition out there, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many more firms than there ever was. Um, and we're competing against kind of both now in-house teams as well as small teams and big teams and freelancers and people's niece and nephew. Like, so the, the competitive world has gotten much wider and harder to win these projects. Um, we all have to pay the bills, especially now. So a lot of times it's out of desperation because we have to pay the bills and, you know, cover our overhead. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of times designers, they're just, and I'm going to make some global generalizations here because I have a tendency to do that. So obviously there are exceptions to everything, but I find working with creatives and you probably find this too, Chris, is that we're people pleasers, right? So we just want people to like us and we want them to be happy. And so what happens with that is we do all this to all this to like win the relationship. We spend a lot of time, what I call building the love of the client and making sure they love us and they want to work with us. And so then when we have to push back on them, we don't because we're afraid they're not going to like us or they're going to leave us. And that actually doesn't happen. I, I, I've encouraged my clients over 30 years to speak back to their clients. And I've never had a client lose somebody because of pushing back if you do it the right way. I see. Um, and I just think there's just a lot of firms out there that's hard to thrive. And so a lot of creatives are doing things that simply to win the, with the project at all costs. Um, and as a result, we're just allowing our clients to control our industry and our business. And I want to start, and now is a really good time to do this, take control of where our industry and where our businesses are going. Mm -hmm. So seem like a good introduction. We can start it off. Let's do it. Great. Okay. So I made a bunch of slides about all the excuses I hear. So I'm assuming I'm going to hear, I'm going to see, or maybe not see, but I'm sure everybody's going to shake their heads yes about this. Um, the first thing I always hear from my clients who are all creative firms, so I work with small to mid-sized creative firms with their business, um, is that clients, so they is being the creative's clients, they don't respect our time. I hear that quite a lot, that the clients are always delayed in delivering things, or they keep us on the phone or in meetings forever, or they don't respond to emails. Uh, so I hear a, a, a tremendous amount about this kind of clients misbehaving in terms of time and not respecting our time. And I can't turn the slides. Hold on. So designers love to complain about clients for sure. That may be the title for this episode. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they don't understand our value. So creators tell me this a lot, that their clients don't understand their value and they're always just thinking of them as they're treating them as a pair of hands rather than as somebody that's a value added or strategic partner. Similar, they treat us like a commodity. So they want to just pay us hourly or, you know, direct us over our shoulders. Clients, clients are not always respectful of how much value we are, we provide to them. Just so I understand the illustration, is that a little designer crawl up on the table underneath all the executives in the room? Yes. Wow. I and, love these illustrations, actually. Okay, so these are not your illustrations? They are not. Okay. Not my design, not my illustration. <laughs> <laughs> are these your words? <laughs> <laughs> these are my words. This is okay. my beliefs. All right, good. Uh, this is why I get to work with creatives. I get to work with great people like this mm -hmm. that can do all this stuff for me. By the way, I pay them all, so none of this is barter. I think that's also really important that I treat creatives just like I want them to be treated. So I pay them full fees. Um, which is why that book was so expensive. <laughs> um, they have an unreal, so I hear this, that you know, clients have an unruly organization. There's a lot of hierarchy, a lot of surprise, stakeholders involved in projects. Um, design by committee is a common thing I hear a lot of. And actually, believe it or not, a lot of these things are fixable if, it's, if you manage the clients right. I hear this a lot. They don't live up to their end of the bargain. They promise they're going to de deliver content on time or they're going to deliver a certain kind of content or they are going to prove things and they don't necessarily live up to their end of the bargain. They change their, their direction in midstream. I'm assuming this all sounds familiar. Yes, it they does. Are, this is the big one, right? They mm -hmm. are direct us. Uh, and I think that's self-explanatory. They're constantly looking over shoulders, make this bigger, you know, add a burst here, change it to this font. So there's a lot of that. And I think all of this, again, is handleable. They will know it when they see it. Sound familiar? Oh. Yes. Clients will always say, we don't like it because we just don't know. We'll love it. We'll, we'll tell you when we like it. Um, so 
I'm going to talk to you. I have this, I just read this book. And so I'm really excited about this book. It has nothing to do with our industry, but I highly recommend it. It's called Being Mortal. Have you read it yet? No. It's such a great book. It's about um, basically uh, how the medical profession te- uh, treats people who are on their end of their life cycle, mm. who are dying. And it's fantastic because I'm very interested in the medical profession and because I have a father that um, unfortunately has cancer and is dying. It was a really interesting book. And in there, every time I read books outside of my industry or our, our industry, I'm always learning things that I can apply to our business. And I want to talk about, and he identified three types of doctors, and they actually so resonated with me in terms of three types of design firms or designers. Mm. So I'm going to sort of make an analogy here. Bear with me. So they're traditionalists, and these are doctors that are like the doc. These are like the doctor knows best doctors, right? I'm going to tell you, I'm the expert. And designers are like this, right? There are prima donna designers out there. They're called prima donnas, uh, who clients just kind of are a little afraid of, honestly. And they're just like, let the designer do what they know and they trust this designer. And the designer has certain personality that comes across as confident and a little cocky and for sure. And so I think there in the old days, especially when I first started my career, there were a lot of superstar designers out there um, that were well known and highly respected and clients would come to them and they would just accept what they did um, and they trusted them. And somehow, We've gone backwards, and now there are these informi- what he calls informative design, informative doctors, mm-hmm. and these are the ones that give you like here are all your options, and these are the doctors that mostly exist now. They're just like you can take this medicine, you do this, and you do this, and you can do this, and you're just overwhelmed, right? Especially when you're about to die, um, and there's too many choices. And the same thing applies to creatives. I find that they're executional designers. We give them a lot of design solutions to choose from. Right? We're not no longer an expert. We're saying, here's five different options when we really should be just possibly even giving them the best option. Um, and we're allowing them to, we're more, again, a pair of hands. We're less, we're giving them different options, but we're not saying, here's the one we want. We're not being considered the expert anymore. So I think there's, I think the industry is divided a lot now between those kind of, kind of expert designers and the ones that are more executional. And I think we're all heading towards the executional path. Mm. Um, and I talk a lot about that in the, my book as well, that there is essentially, I feel like the industry is divided now between what I call strategists and executional designers. Strategists are maybe doing less work, but bigger projects and are valued and, and are trusted. And then a large bulk of designers are just doing the work to pay the bills and just based on the client, here's our brand guidelines, here's what we need, go do it. And we want it to look like this, or we want you to move this, this pixel. Um, and then he's talking about, I love this, this interpretive now. So he wants doctors ahead to be more, more interpretive, which is a good kind of mix between the two, which is basically we just help the patients. We tell them the different options, but we guide them to the right direction. And I think that's where our designers should be. We should be more trusted advisors. Can you see that slide? Yeah. There we go. Um, and. Trusted advisors are people that come, people go to as experts, but that also can, are flexible enough to give them a few, maybe a few different options, but really lead them to the best option. Or be more advisory in terms of how to manage the relationship. So I just want people to think about that as I talk about some um, recommendations on how we can do better for our industry, because I want you to decide where you want it to land, because I think that it's really hard to do both. You can't. And firms try to do both. They're like executional designers and they're strategists, right? So the strategists, they come up with the brand and they come up with the strategy. And then they want to also execute all this stuff. They want to do site maintenance. They want to just execute all the stuff against brand guidelines. And that's fine, but that work can be turned into executional. So when that client wants to go back to you for other brand work or higher level work, after a while, they think of you as executional because you've been doing that kind of work for them for so long. They forget that you also were advisory and strategist at the beginning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so here's some suggestions on how we can help our industry and things that we can do to practice a bit good behavior. And the first one, and this is a big one. I think this drives everything I ever recommend in terms of my business, in terms of consulting to my clients. You can't change anything until you know who you are and where you're going. 
so many of us, so many of us are reactionary. We're just responding to the client's need. Hey, they like us. They'll we want we anybody who works with anybody who calls us to work with us. We work with every client that comes on on board, right? So anybody that calls us, we want to work with them. Uh, we'll do any kind of deliverable. I'm working with a client right now, and I'm doing a whole strategy around press and 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 thought leadership. And I was asking them, what kind of deliverables do you do? And she's like, we'll do anything. Well, that's really hard because I think clients want somebody that's an expert and be able to do a lot of deliverables is not necessarily an expert. Um, so I think the first thing you should really think about in looking at your business, either a new business or an existing business, is to decide really who you are rather than allowing the clients to direct our business, which I think we're doing. And I think that's our biggest mistake. We're allowing the incoming work, all the referral-based business, to drive the direction of who we are, what we provide, how our voice is, um, what our expertise is, what our passions are. And so I want you to look at your firm and think, like, who am I? Who do I want to be? Who do I want to work with? Uh, what kind of clients? What kind of projects? What's my passion? Um, so I think that's really important. Before you can make any decisions, before you think about pricing, before you think about new business, this is the thing you need to do. And I don't think we spend enough time doing that. So the first thing is know who you are and where you're going. How do you do that? What? How do you do that? <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, this is a perfect time to do it because we all will have plenty of time on our hands. Uh, it's really looking deeply at First of all, it's led by the principal, not necessarily the team. I think the first mistake we often do is allow our team to drive the direction of our business. And the team is always going to change. People leave. People come and go. And it really should be whoever's leading the firm needs to think about the initial direction and then share it with the rest of the team to get their buy-in and their, and their acceptance. I really spend a lot of time with I spend a, uh, at least a full day doing a SWOT analysis with my clients, like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threat, threats. You have to think about what you love to do, who you currently work with, what are the pros and cons of the different areas. So we, you've had a lot of, um, I'm sure, a lot of um, live streams about specialization. Yes. And I'm, a, I'm one of the big proponents of specialization. Ooh. So one of the first thing is to identify what industries you want to work for. What do you like? What's the opportunities out there? And, and it's really hard right now to differentiate yourself, right? So there's so much competition. Um, so you really need to look at the kind of work you're doing, but also the work you want to do and see, is there a common thread? And can I sell that? And it's not, there's lots of ways, and I talk about this in my book a lot, about different ways of specialization. I personally really prefer to specialize by industry. And I will, here's the part I'm going to yell at creatives for, and, and I don't want to really make this talk about specialization, but most creatives, because we have all good hearts, the first thing they say to me, and I sort of just like, I laugh, but I also cry at the same time. They say this to me all the time. Well, I want to specialize in doing good, social good, nonprofits, you know, working with people that are making a difference to the world. And I love that personally. I want to make a difference in the world, especially where we're going. I think we need that. But that's no longer a specialization because every designer I've ever met, a large portion of their portfolio is in nonprofits and 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 doing good and social good and in um, you know any kind of company that's doing good for the world. Nobody wants to work for an evil company, but honestly, you look deep enough, pretty much everybody does something not quite ethical. Uh, not that that's right or wrong. Um, so. I really want you to look at maybe even specializing further. So if you love to do do good work for good, I worked with one client and what we looked at the common thread of what she cared about and what she was passionate about was community building. So we really focused on things that were focused on communities like housing projects for the for seniors or for homeless people. And so she was targeting organizations that were more focused on community building, which I thought would at least was a more of a targeted positioning. So we just, to, in order to know who you are, you have to look deep. And spend some time looking at what you're currently doing and where you want to go, what other competitors are doing that you admire, what your local and regional and national markets are doing. It's a whole process around discovering yourself. I don't think it should be a whole, like you shouldn't spend too much time because I think designers have a little ten, tends to do a lot of research and they never go anywhere. So at some point you have to try to land on places and just land on some decisions and try it out for about six months and see if it works. Yeah, but I, I work with my clients to help them with that, really. 
it's hard. It's hard. Sometimes I think you have to get somebody else involved in it to lead the conversation because it's really hard to look at yourself. Mm. Right. So I have a little story. May I interject a little yes. story here to help people understand sure. this idea of specialization and, and possibly niching down? I know, especially right now, a lot of you guys are scared. Mm -hmm. uh, budgets are tightening. People are getting laid off. And, it, and this whole money river, it's completely frozen until something happens here. And hopefully something will happen in the next few days to kind of loosen up the spending. And we get that. And people think, well, especially in times like this, we should be generalists so that we can fill in more jobs in case they pop up. And I think that kind of thinking will lead to your doom. Now, yes. I'm going to share this concept. Uh, I just thought of it this morning unrelated to what we're talking about. But think of your relationship with your client and you as a gift exchange. And you can think of it as a birthday party or just a general party where you give them something and they give you something. What are they going to give you? And they're going to give you cash, and that's because that's what you want. If they gave you biscuits or spaghetti sauce, you might not be thrilled about that. What you want is cash, and they understand that, so they're going to give you cash. What are you going to give them? Well, if you know anything about gift giving, the more you know about a person, the better the gift can be. So if you've not paid attention to this person at all, you might think they want a watch or they want a, a toy race car or a skateboard and then realize none of those things matter to them. You might buy them a year's worth of meat and later on learn that they're vegan. So the idea of specialization is, is it can be boiled down to this. You want to give somebody a gift, your gift, but you need to find the person who's going to appreciate your gift. And so there's two ways to do it. You can be very clear about what kind of gifts you make and attract people to you. Or you can target certain types of people and understand, I really like those people, I believe in them, and I'm going to change what it is that I do to better suit their needs. Now, here's an example. Like, Mom, if you're listening to this, I love you. Uh, you're the most amazing woman in the world, for sure. But my mom is not exactly great at gift giving. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. She has ideas in her head. And I'll tell you a little story. I graduated from Arts Center College of Design in 1995, and my parents were there. And my mom gave me this box, and it was a heavy box. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so good, this box. I get home, I rip open my box. Now, mind you, my parents have already helped to pay for some of my education, and I love them to death. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. So I wasn't really expecting anything. But when I went to open up this box, do you know what was inside? It was a giant jar of pecans. <laughs> that I assume she bought from, from Costco, because that's where my mom likes to shop. And I was like... Uh, thank you. Like, I don't know how to react to this. I was like, mom, I love you, but pecans, like I just finished four years of torture and here I am and I got pecans. So think about that. So some of you guys do some really wonderful, amazing things. You might make a logo website. You might do amazing packaging, but if the person that you want to work with doesn't care for this thing, what is the point of trying to give it to them? So of course they're going to pay you very little. They're going to make you uh, bid on projects. They're going to price comparison, um, yeah. different bids. They're going to tell you what to do because you just gave them something that they didn't want. I hope this analogy helps. Guys, think about yeah. this. It's a gift exchange. They gave you something that you want. In return, you should give them something that they want. And the way you do that is you start to tell people, these are the kinds of things that I make. If you appreciate this, then I'll give it to you. But if you're yeah. a general store, you make so many things. You, It's like it's very hard for you to find the right partner to give something to. Having said that, I turn it right back to you. Emily, thank you. That's a great analogy. Actually, I was just thinking of bad gifts. My father once gave me um, flowers. <laughs> he gave me a bouquet of flowers. Okay. And I didn't quite, like, that seemed like the most impersonal gift. You know, he just sent it in the mail, like, flew a floral, florist. And it was just the weirdest thing. I'm like, why? There was no reason. Anyway, that was just a gift yeah. that I thought was weird. Um, so one more thing about specialization, and I think that's a really great analogy. The one thing I tell people is a few things about specialization. Besides charging more, it differentiates you. And a lot of designers, they don't know where to get new business. They're frozen around new business. And and if without knowing who they are, that's why, because they could go after everybody, right? They keep going after the local small business or the local restaurant and a large national corporation. Um, and so what happens with designers is because they don't know who they are, they don't know their specialization, they don't do new business. So all I like to say is sometimes specialization starts with just giving you a focus for new business. Who do you want to go after? Yeah. Who do you want to reach? That's all you need right now. Maybe you start with that. Maybe a lot of designers are afraid of landing and saying and taking a stake in the ground and saying, this is only what I do. 
So first start with one industry or one kind of client you want to work for and go after it. Without knowing who we are, we don't know who to go after. Um, and I think the other thing we need to do is communicate our value. I'm sure you've looked at many, many competitor sites. We all sound the same. Every design firm sounds the same. Um, and so you really need to think about your voice and your value. And that includes case studies. I've seen so many case studies that show beautiful pictures of the work and quotes from the client, but there's no metrics. How did we solve their problems? So quantitative da data is really important to capture. So anytime you finish a project, you should be asking what that data is. How did you, what you do and your services and your value contribute to the end product? How did it affect ROI or return on investment? So I think we need to ask our clients for better data about why we have helped them solve their problems. And we need to communicate our, problem, our value much more. I think designers as an industry do not spend enough time talking about how we impact our clients' businesses. And I think we need to be more advisory. We need to take control of the relationships and really kind of, instead of just saying, if a client says, you need a, you know, we need you to develop an app, you might say, you know, an app is not the right thing for you right now. Or whatever they're asking for, really, you don't have to say, yes, that's what you need. You should really think about, and you should try to attract clients that really want you to tell them what you need, what they need. A lot of times we're just like, they need a brochure, they need a logo, and you go ahead and do it without really questioning, do they need that or advising them what they need? So now during this kind of coronavirus thing, um, it's a really great time to be advisory, to call our clients and say, what else can we do? One of my clients does a lot of work for um, educational institutions and cultural institutions. And so there's, and they do mostly publication work, but they're upselling the idea that they can, because they need to do fundraising and they need to be building more awareness of their institutions. So they're kind of pivoting a little bit to provide their clients with new services and recommending things that they can do. I absolutely think, I'm a big believer in doing what's called um, strategic summits with the clients on a quarterly basis. Upsell, like I will meet with you on a quarterly basis for a few hours just to talk about your business and to see if I can help you and to have, recommend ideas for what you can do to elevate your, your current strategy in terms of creative deliverables. I don't think we do that enough. We're just waiting for clients to tell us what they need rather than going after them and saying, here's what we think you need. And this is why. Mm, I like that. Yeah. I, I think that's the best relationships, right? So where clients come to you for your, their advice, your advice, they want to know, they don't know necessarily the answer. Like if they're having an event, well, right now they're not having any, but if, <laughs> if they're having an event, you might have interesting ideas about doing experiential things that they would never have thought about. So don't be afraid to give advice and to recommend new solutions for things that they didn't even think about. That will increase your value and then it will change your pricing significantly. And that's all I want them about is increasing our prices. Mm -hmm. Hey, I just want to quickly mention, if you, in case you're joining us late to this live stream, it's 1140 here, so we're a few minutes in. I'm talking to Emily Ruth Cohen. She wrote this book. It's an amazing book. It's called Brutally Honest. Uh, if nothing else, if nothing else, the design alone and the printing is super amazing. Not to mention all the information that's packed in there, all the knowledge that she's uh, developed over 30 years of teaching the business of design to people. Okay, back to you. Yeah. And well, I, I, I'm excited about talking about that book because I know you had some questions about it. So yes. I'm looking forward to having that, that conversation. Okay, so moving forward, um, I think the other thing we need to do is be more proactive and pay attention to red flags. We are so in, in, involved with our clients' lives and we get to love them and engage with them, but we don't, we sort of go in with rose tinted glasses. We're not paying too attention to those huge red flags at the very beginning of a relationship. They're just staring you right in the face and you somehow are just like, la di da you know. Um, some of them are like, if a client keeps you on the phone for hours or doesn't return your emails or there are unexpected stakeholders that come to meetings that you didn't expect. Anything like that, you should be reading those signals before you even start working with them. And a lot of them are easy to find, easy to discover earlier on in the relationship, even before you write the proposal. I was in a meeting, a new business meeting at a big um, real estate company for a client. I came in with to the presentation. Sometimes I'll sh uh, be with my clients during the presentation um, process to pitch the work or pitch the capabilities. 
And we had, I did everything to plan for the meeting. I asked who the stakeholders were going to be in the meeting, what their role in the meeting was, what their role in the project was going to be. And then we had the meeting and two new people showed up that weren't there that we didn't expect. And the meeting went in a completely different direction. And so I was able to take control of the meeting and bring it back on track. But if you allow our clients to kind of redirect things or bring in, we should just be paying attention to that stuff. Who are these new stakeholders? If they already did that, even though we did the best we could, that's a red flag and we need to charge higher or add more revisions knowing that there'll be more stakeholders. So all I'm saying is adjust our scope of work for the red, every red flag you see, you adjust your scope of work. And I have this kind of rule of thumb. For every red flag, you raise your fee by 10%. It's good rule uh, of thumb. <laughs> like every red flag, just count them and then add your fee and you know, incre increase your fee accordingly. And honestly, everybody's red flags are different. And so you might be really patient with some things and impatient with others. So my perfect example of this, as you can tell, I speak really fast um, and I'm right to the point. And I, my red flag for clients, for me, is when people speak really slowly and never get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, those clients drive me crazy and I usually charge them more <laughs> because I just don't have the patience and I don't have the time to spend hours on the phone when they could have told me something in 10 minutes. That's my red flag. You might be fine with those kinds of people, right? So we all have different things that drive us crazy, but there are some common ones. And the common ones are a lot of stakeholders is definitely one of them or somebody that is not a main decision maker. Mm. Right. So every I just want I want clients to be more designers to be more aware of that before they start the relationships. Because you can detect all that stuff and protect yourself by the scope of work and by your fees. Or by saying this magical word I'm going to talk about later. No. Okay. I like that magic word by the way. I do. I love that. It's my favorite word. <laughs> uh, and you need to control the terms of the relationship. Here's, here's my, big, my big frustration with our industry right now. We are accepting terms and conditions in client contracts that are really hurting our industry. There's two in particular. One, which has been going on for a while, the work for hire situation, which I know that you've talked about, Chris, extensively. Work for hire essentially means clients want this work for hire contract. Essentially means they own everything you do. Um, both the preliminary concepts and the final concepts. And the challenge with that is that they're not paying you for that additional value. They can use all of that stuff you're providing for other things. So a perfect example of this is uh, one of my clients designed a logo, just a logo for an association. And it was a very illustrative illustration, Ill illustrative logo. And he had beautiful solutions. Like he gave them 10 different ideas. They accepted one and they used it. But then they used all the other ideas for t-shirts and premium items, Ooh. right? And it was unexpected, but luckily he worked with me and didn't have a work for hire contract. So we were protected. In that case, if you had a work for hire, they would have been allowed to use that stuff, right? So we have to be very careful about that. We have to push back. If they want work for hire, they should be paying us significantly more. I always say I don't sign work for hire contracts unless they're over a hundred thousand. Can you explain to everybody who may not know that term work for hire? What does that mean? What is that? What are you it, agreeing to? It, that's exactly what you're agreeing to. It's you're agreeing. What I said before is that for everything you deliver, they, the client will own everything you deliver. Mm. That means preliminary concepts, anything you deliver, all the work in progress, they own. As opposed to owning the final concept for use for a specific thing. Right? So, Perfect example, if you're designing an event, if you design an event under like an identity for an event for work for hire, they can use that event, event identity for all future events. So if, they ha if that's a yearly event, they can use it year after year, the same identity. Now, if you price it that way, that's great, but they might use preliminary concepts, concepts that you've created for future events, and they didn't pay for that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that a good way of explaining yeah. it? Um, yeah. I've seen work for hire, like even just here's, I, maybe this is an old school example, but annual reports. One of my clients did an annual report did, did under a work for hire and they, the client then used that exact same format for 10 annual reports, 
10 years of the annual reports and they never used the designer for those 10 years. Mm. So they got tremendous value out of a one-time project. Mm. So anyway, so work for hire is, is just a, a damaging clause and we should be looking at our, essentially what I'm saying is designers read your contracts. If you don't understand them, ask the lawyer what it means or write your own contract. Um, the other clause that I think is really, I think this is a new one. This I've just seen in the last year that's becoming more and more common and one that I'm really having a problem with, which is when clients are asking us not to be able to show the work that we do for them or use the name of the client to promote ourselves. Wow. So they're restraining our ability to promote ourselves by using our client's work. I've seen this more and more common as a, a common request. And I'm not even sure why it exists. I think partially they want the in-house team to be credited and they don't want other people to know. And honestly, that's a reasonable request for confidential work, right? For work that they, you that is done internally or for investors that is private. I get that, but it's not great for work that's already out in the public. And we should be able to promote our work. If we can't tell people, hey, we work with these big name clients, if we can't use their names to promote ourselves, it's going to be hard to market ourselves and to get new business. And more and more firms are simply accepting that at face value. Like, and so they can't literally show the work on their website or use the name of their clients. Have you seen that, Chris? I'm seeing that so much more. Yes, I see it, especially in tech companies, companies like Apple, yeah. uh, Facebook. There's a couple that are very secretive about what it is that they do. Oh, yeah. and they don't want you to share any of the work. Yeah. Microsoft. And, yeah. And I think this is, I think I, I know what I'm going to hear from people. They're going to say, well, we can't argue against contracts. And I'm going to say, yes, you can. I've had a lot of success arguing against clauses that hurt us. And the way you can do that is one, write your own contracts first and make sure if you know the client is sending you a contract, you say, well, that's great, but I want to send you my terms first. So your lawyers can incorporate our terms. If the client client says, no, we only have our contract, you can say, that's great. I want to have a review it. And then you push back and say, here's some things that we don't agree with, or here's the consequences of that. And the only way you can do that is if you have a client that loves you and who's your advocate. If you have not built the love, and I'm going to talk about that later, if you have not made sure that your client adores you and will be your advocate and defend you, then it's very hard to negotiate contracts. So you have to have a client that you can talk to human to human, face to face and say, here's what you're asking. Like a lot of times the clients have their lawyers write the contracts and their lawyer's job is to protect the client, not you. So if you just simply say to the client, hey, this is what your lawyer is asking. Here's how it's hurt, hurts me. And if you want this, then I need to charge double. The client's going to take that out of the contract. And obviously you're not going to win every battle, but I do think you should be arguing this more. I think we're accepting these contracts because we're fearful of, our, of making the client angry or fearful of losing the relationship. I, I personally have had a lot of success guiding my clients and pushing back on these terms. So I've, I've seen it's possible. Yes, it's not going to be possible in every situation. And if you're getting paid half a million dollars, then I'm fine with those kind of clauses. But if you're working on a $20,000 project, I am not fine with those clauses. Okay, so I have some things I want to bring up here. I agree Great. with you. I agree with you. Now, at a certain part, uh, point, our clients pay is, I want to say, so much money, I don't even care. But I want to think about this a little bit. I agree with you. I just want to say this for the record. I agree. But let me try to understand this in a different way. Emily, let's say you hire a really amazing architect or interior designer. Right. And they build you this really custom home and you've paid them good money for their services. Yeah. So you feel like the transaction is complete, the exchange of value is done. And then they go on to publish or want to publish your house, your interior, and you're a very private person and you don't right. like people seeing the way you live. So now you have a problem. There's a, a like right. a privacy issue here. And you might think to yourself, well, uh, why do I need to pay you extra for you not to show my very private things? Right. How do you respond to that? Well, very much what I just said. That's private. So somebody's home is not public. So I get, I get that those kind of clauses need to exist for proprietary private issues, things that are not in the public domain. So things that like people have seen or that has been released to the public 
you should be actually, so a house is not a great example, to be honest with you, because that's private. That's only for people that have been invited in, right? Yes, but... But an art, they should be able to show the outside of the building because everybody's seeing the outside of the building. Okay, but that's not much there to see the outside. Right. So I, I think, okay, so how do you respond to the idea that you agree to make something, I agree to pay for it, right. and why is there an extra stipulation here why I should allow you to do more because than that. My fee is reflecting based on a certain expectation. I, I can't promote it because I'm, I'm, the benefit I'm getting is also be able to work with you and being able to show this work. If I can't show my work, if all my clients want this clause, and this is what I'm afraid of, is that all clients are going to want this clause, how are we going to show ourselves? How are we going to be able to promote ourselves if we have no work to show for it? So we need to make sure that we don't allow this to become commonplace. It's, there are obviously going to be exceptions to the rule where it's proprietary, where it's special cases. Yeah. But for most cases, you should be able to show the work. Okay, so... Um, because that's how we get business. How do we get business otherwise? Okay. Unless we get another value. If we get... Um, if we can show it at least um, on one-to-one. -one. Maybe we can't show it on our website. Maybe that's a little bit more acceptable. Um, that's fine. We, you know, but not, client, not a lot of clients will agree to that. So we just want to... I just want people to push back and ask questions. Sure. Because I think, I do think we should be able to show our work. Architects show their work all the time. They do show interior design. So it is common in architecture as well. And I've seen this with most industries that are allowed to show their work. Right. They do with permission. But have you seen the inside of Bill Gates' house? No. Me neither. Yeah, but I don't, I don't follow interior design magazines. But yeah, now but, with social media, you get to see like all these you know comedians I mean? are doing the, their shows on in their houses, and I love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, so there's very different kinds of people who who have different relationships with yeah. the public, and we get that. So right. uh, let's just say I'm your client right now. I would say, yeah. Emily, we love you. Here's the deal. We'll give you as much work as you want. The problem is we don't want competitors to see your creative process because we're not trying to help our competitors any little bit because they're going to hire someone else to do this and it's going to hurt us. I'm not saying show the process. I'm saying show the final work. First of all, if Bill Gates paid you a million dollars to design something and they want, they want, he wants nobody to see it, I'm fine with it because it's a million dollars. Right. I'm talking about those projects that are under $100,000 that you simply are not allowed to show. So I think there's a different in terms of the analogy. Yes. Um, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, but I'm just telling you the kinds of clients we we've worked with in okay. the past. They they don't not all of them a small percentage I would say under ten percent don't want you to show it anywhere because they want full control of their own IP. But they it's released to the public, so there's no they the public has seen it. Their logo is right. out there. Their product is out there. But their let me let me phrase it a there. different way. Like we we make commercials and music videos, right? So the band doesn't want more than one source for the video because they want all the traffic to go to one place. Right. Uh, the commercial, they also want it to go to one portal and not 300 places. And so there's, it's like their IP. Like if you watch a sporting event, just because you love it, doesn't mean that you can stream it I, and share it everywhere, yes. right? But there, so even in that case, yes. you could still use, as long as you could still say that we work with this band or we work with, you know, this company to do that commercial, we can use the client's name. Yep. That's one thing. Okay. And we can use freeze frames. We don't have to show the whole thing. It doesn't have to be a live version of the video. It could just be screenshots. Okay. So as long as we're able to show the work in any way possible, it, I understand they have to control where it's being used sometimes. I get that. Yeah. But you should be able to show some of the work. So, Rachel, I'm the CMO of a really large multi-billion dollar Fortune 500, Fortune 100 company. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of people who attach themselves to us. They, they might have touched something and it gets out of control. So, as a policy across the board, we're not allowing anybody to mention us unless it's submitted in it for approval by our legal team. And then you could you could share it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that okay? a reasonable, that's a reasonable request as long as you provide approval to use it within two weeks. Because the other thing is it might be... Uh, I mean, oh, I'm serious. Yeah, like you could it. put restrictions around it. Like if sure. they need to see it first, and I think that's a reasonable request, right? Yeah. They want to see how you're using the work or see the wording behind it. I absolutely think that's reasonable. But you could simply say that I need that approval within a week or two. Yeah. Right? I can't, like, or maybe it's a year after launch. As long as at some point you give them timing and expectations mm. of how you, I just want you to take control of it. I like more. that. So you, you have a lot of options there. I, I, you're like really, uh, I think, uh, what are you, an Aries? No, what are you? I am an Aries. Okay, I saw it in the book. You're an Aries, and it's a fire sign. Is that right? Yes. You're very fiery. I love this. I love this, guys. I, I want to explain something. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm trying to 
express a lot of things I hear that you're going to say after the show. Yes. Like, why didn't you ask her this? This is how I feel about this. Okay. So I'm going to throw one more at you and then we're going to move on. Okay. Yeah. Notes like that doesn't sound fair. If it gets viewed publicly, you should be able to share it. Okay. Everybody, you all understand that. It seems like a very logical line of thought. I'm going to ask you just one question. Just you, the public watching this video. Okay. Let's say you're working on a really big, super cool project. One of the best projects, you, a dream project, the dream project of your life. And you bring on a team of seven or eight people. And when the project's done, it's on seven or eight websites after the fact. And you're like, man, I sacrifice. I risk so much. I've worked 10 years to get to this position. And now you're going to put this out in the market and share the same work. Yeah, I see that there's a little credit or where you did it at the bottom. But you're going to confuse people to think that you did the work. That you did it by yourself. And then I'm going to lose the, the, the PR potential of this thing. Now, I'm pretty sure most people are going to, oh, that, that doesn't feel quite right either. So a lot of times we make assumptions about like how the world should treat us, but we never think about how we treat the world. Just something for you to think about, okay? Because that happens. If you run a firm and you hire people, there's a person who like might have put a label on the box and next thing you know, the entire project is on their site. Super okay. unethical, very misleading, but this happens all the time. And that, that's sort of a separate issue. I, I think we should also, whoever works with us, our employees and our contracts need to have, contractors need to have agreements about the right to show the work. Because if the clients don't give permission for you, for them to show the work, only you, you need, you're responsible for that. So you need to have some agreements with your contractors and your employees, what they can and cannot show. Yeah. Because it isn't fair to the clients. And I've had clients complain where they've seen the work on other people's site that they said they never, they, like, I never worked with that person. Right, but we have the same thing. To work with their, yeah, so you have to control that. That again is going back to owning the control of your business and your relationships with contractors and employees. All right. And like I said, I have hard and fast rules, but there's always exceptions to everything. Yeah. And there's ways to negotiate. That's all I'm saying is it should be win-win. So if you're going to sign, the, the reason why I'm so against this this clause is because I think if we all do this, if we all sign this, and I'm seeing this more commonly then nobody's going to be able to promote our work when nobody's going to be able to use it the work because it becomes more and more common. Just like uh, stock, kind of the stock market, stock illustration killed illustrators market. I think this is going to be the one that kills us if we don't just watch it. And if we obviously are going to accept some of those, but those are for the big projects where the client's respecting us and paying us what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right? Okay. So control the terms. Control the terms. Um, and now you've heard me talk about this, and I talk a lot about this whenever I speak. It's about building the love. You have to make sure that you spend a lot of time making sure the client absolutely, absolutely loves you, but doesn't walk all over you, right? So it's really about spending time making sure that you have an advocate and building that love. And I don't think we do that enough because we're spending so much time just reacting to things and, and hurrying along, and we don't even meet our clients in person. We don't make the time to really just take them out to lunch one time, spend some time on, the, on a Skype with them, just talking about how life is, right? Um, I think we do that. If we connect to people humanly, one-to-one, -one, people are going to be more respectful of you. When I have to deal with, I spend a lot of my time consulting with my clients. Um, usually I'm hired for two reasons. One, they are doing really well and they want to elevate their business, and I love those clients. But then I have clients, creatives that have clients that are just very abusive or there's a big challenge. And a lot of times it's because they have allowed the client to misbehave and haven't built the love. They've never met the client in person. You know, they've never really just had a conversation about their lives and just trying to get to know them and what drives them. So spend a little time doing that, but not, not at the risk of allowing them to be too friendly where they walk all over you or you allow them to walk all over. So I just am a big believer in building the love, spending as much time as we can doing that. Mm. The other thing I would recommend is that whenever we're generous, because creatives, we're generous all the time. We're always over delivering all the time. We always give them extra concepts, extra rounds of revisions. And I think that's fabulous. But what I have a problem with is we don't tell our clients that we are being generous. All I'm saying is just say, hey, I'm going to do this extra concept because I want to help you out here where this, this round of revisions wasn't included, but I want to help you out so that they know what you've given them for free. So when then you need to put some boundaries on it, they already know that you over delivered. 
So let's start bragging about our generosity. If we generosity, if we end <laughs> up you know providing more pages on a brochure or we do more screens on a website, that's fine. If you choose to do that, that's fine. Just tell the clients, hey, I did this thing. You know, I wanted to help you out. Hmm. How do you do that in a way that doesn't feel? What's the I, I'm, I'm the like, term? I know gloating. what you're going to say. What is that? Gloating. Yeah. Not gloating, but it's it's almost like uh, you should be so appreciative of this. It's no, yeah, no, you know none of saying? that. None of this Jewish guilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word for that, Emily? Like, oh, I don't know. I know what you're saying. You're making the. You don't want to be the martyr. Like, you're not trying to be yeah. the martyr. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually think you do it just nicely. Like that's what I'm saying. If you say as a favor, I'm going to do this because I want to help you out. That's different than. Don't you love me? Because I'm helping you out. Like I think it's a, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a tone of voice. Okay. Yeah. It's how you phrase it, um, and it's when you say it. Okay, Jonah, do we have the ability to split our screens so that we can see Emily on one side and myself we on the other? Not. We do not. not on this All one. this money you've made me spend, Jonah, now we've lost the ability to split the screen. Okay. So, Emily, I want to ask you something, okay? Just work with me here. Let's say you designed two extra pages uh, for the brochure that the clients didn't pay for, and you just wanted yeah. to do it as an act of generosity. How yeah. might you say it to me as a client? Sure. You can say, um, this. The, the content you gave us is expanding the brochure by two pages. It's not a big deal because our, our, our budget was based on 16 pages, but we can throw in, well, actually... Two extra pages doesn't make sense. It has to be, you know, sure. four pages. So let's say they give you four pages. Uh, you can say, I'm just going to throw in the four pages because you, you have this great content. I don't want to lose any of it. Um, but if it does expand beyond that, let's talk. Well done. Well done. Okay. Now you guys know how to do that. I've been I doing like this that. for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you just mastered I, I, it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So keep the arguments coming because yeah. I, I love that because I want you to represent you know, creatives, because they are going to oh, push yeah. back. And I have pretty much all the answers to everything I hear. I, I've heard. So keep pushing back. It's great. Uh, <laughs> we also just lead by example. Here's my, I have a, a big problem with this also. Creatives, we never respond to our emails. And sometimes yeah. we brag about having thousands of emails unread. That is not something we should brag about. Like I literally see tw tweets from some of my clients bragging about how many emails they have unopened or whatever. You know, they, if we are not on time to meetings, if we are disrespectful of our client schedules and don't meet their schedules, if we have mistakes in our work, then we are allowing our clients to also misbehave. So be as good and as responsible as you possibly can be. Return people's emails within 24 hours. Mm. And if you can't, just say, I'm really busy right now, but I promise I've gotten your email and I will respond. And you can have templates for that. But I do think that we should, we should be just leading by example. And this, again, is a parent thing. Like, we want our kids to behave and we, just like we behave, and we want our clients to behave as well. Right? So if we show that we are behaving, they will be much more responsive. So if we show up on time, and if we manage a meeting, if we give agendas, then the clients will look to us to lead that and to say, oh, maybe I should be providing an agenda, right? So just lead by good behavior. Good. Emily, you, you uh, coach creatives? I do. Well, I'm a, not a coach. I'm a consultant. You're a consultant. So you're difference. a consultant for creatives. Oh, tell me the difference. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Coaches are nice and soft. <laughs> Wait, not all coaches. Your <laughs> jujitsu coach might disagree with you, but okay. Yeah. Coaches are getting you to guide you to the final decision and to help you navigate your own internal things to get to the same conclusion that they might already know. Mostly as a consultant, I am hearing you and listening to you and telling you the answers and the challenge and helping you to fix problems. I'm much more kind of, I personally think there's a difference between a coach and a consultant. Okay. I don't have, you know, and I... I a lot of coaches have processes and tools they use. I don't. Every one of my clients is different because they have different personalities and different needs, and I adjust my services to fit their needs and my approach. Okay. And I'm, I'm basically, I give them the answers, and they could not take all the answers, you know, even though they'll find out I was right. <laughs> uh, they don't have to listen to everything, but if they listen to enough, they will see a big impact in their business. Okay. Whereas coaches, I think people eventually guide them there. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big believer in coaches, and that's why. Because I don't see as much. I mean, I think there are fabulous coaches out there. I shouldn't say that. But I'm definitely not a career coach. I'm a business consultant. 
Sure. And there's some coaches out there like, I don't believe in consultants. It's okay. Yeah. It's just yeah. about no, how totally we help good. people, right? It's yeah. okay. And, so, and there are clients that do need coaches. So some of my clients need leadership coaching. I don't provide that. You know, like if they need, if they're not good leaders, I give them the tools, how to be the leader, but I can't help them change their behavior. That's what a coach is great at. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. All right. Well, the reason why I asked you that is there are some very positive comments here in the chat as, that I'm monitoring. And in case you guys can hear me typing on the keyboard, I apologize. I'm trying to type as softly as possible, but I'm trying to take notes for the recap, guys, in case you hear that. But here, here's what people are saying. She's amazing. She's she's like the, my kind of person. So if people want to hire you, how do they do that? Mm. We came right to the point here. Uh, you can go to my website and send me an email. Okay. And that's at emilycohen.com? Uh, yeah, and I have different services. We can talk about that. I didn't really want to be promotional here, but absolutely. I'm, I oh, love it's okay when I do it, so don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm very picky about who I work with. Yeah. And I would say to you, if you're like a one-person firm, you probably can't afford me. Okay, can we talk about money? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, if I want to work with you, is there a price range? Are there different packages? Like, can I even There's afford different packages? You? Yeah. yeah. It, people, most people can afford me because they see the value in my services. I'm not super expensive. I don't want to give prices on, on because every one of my clients is different. Okay. Um, I do have a minimum engagement. I don't usually work for less than three thousand. Mm -hmm. um, and even then, it's a little tricky. But you know, so I'm not working hourly. I'm not one of those people that can call. You can call once in a while and just pay hourly. I just don't work that way. Mm. Um, I'm very David and I. David Baker and I are very similar in that way. I you see. know, we have packages. Very nice. And you'll be, yeah, so you'll be hearing from David tomorrow. Which is I will. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just move faster. So be empathetic. We have to be caring about our clients and understand what they're going through. So when clients misbehave, there's usually a trigger and a reason. You should be paying attention to what's going on in their lives and what's going on in the business. So you can be a little empathetic, but not a pushover. So at some point, our empathy gets away from us and we allow the clients to push us. And so we have to understand what the context of their misbehaving is and respond in a way that's kind, but also forceful enough that we get our, we're understanding, but also we express our, the impact on our business. We should have clearly defined processes. I think we all work differently for each client. Every client has a different process and that is not efficient. And clients are coming to us for our expertise. If we don't have defined ways of working then they will misbehave. The more we can tell them, this is how we behave, this is how we work, here's our process, here's our scope of work, the more they will understand how we work and respect that. So I think a lot of times we don't necessarily communicate our processes enough. And especially, this is another advantage of being a special, specialization, special, specialist. special, to specialize. I'm having word problems today. Uh, if you specialize, then it's easier to have clearly defined processes because you work with similar clients or similar projects. Right. 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 Um, we should also tell clients who to work with. So I see this a lot too, which is that clients will CC everybody on your team or they don't, they'll send, the, the, you know, they'll ask somebody for something and they'll ask the wrong person. So I, I like to give my clients at the very beginning of a relationship, here's all the people that are involved in this project and here's who you should contact for different things. Hmm. So project managers should be, you should talk to bud about budgets and schedules with our project manager. You should talk about concept concepts with our art director. You should talk about revisions with our junior designer, right? Or whatever, whoever it is. And, just, and I'd like to get pictures of people at the beginning. Here's who you work with. Here's their name. Here's their title. Here's their email. And here's who you reach. So I like to tell clients who they work with and what everybody's role is. We should also proactively communicate. Um, we are so reactive, especially in this current climate. We're just so reactive in that everything is fast turnaround. You know, my biggest complaint, I do a lot of staffing strategies also with my clients, helping them to build up or compress their teams or change their teams. And one of the biggest complaints I hear from staff is that they are just overwhelmed with work. And it's not that they're working longer hours, it's just the, the, the amount of work we have to do is getting we're just getting shorter deadlines for things so we're having to do a lot of great creative in like a day <laughs> instead of two weeks um so we need to be able to proactively communicate how we work what our schedules are 
when the client's misbehaving. So I'm a big believer in communicating and just keeping the client updated on a daily basis or as needed of what's happening. Here's what we're doing. Here's what you're supposed to be doing. Here's when you should be paying. So I personally like to remind my clients when they when money is due, when uh, approval, just to remind them when approvals are due, just to give them a little nudge. I'm a big believer in being a nag. So embrace your inner nag. I think clients, if you are being too much of a nag, they'll let you know. But I think you should try to just remind clients and communicate with them. The more you communicate, the more they'll communicate back. A lot of times the reason why clients are misbehaving is you haven't given them the schedule or you've, you've broken the schedule or you haven't reminded them when things are due. So I know a lot of this is you're going to say that clients, we've done that and the clients still don't behave. I get that. But if we can do all of these things, I think the clients are going to behave better. Not that I know it. Um, this probably you're not going to be surprised by, <laughs> but I'm a big believer in being honest. <laughs> <laughs> This just in. <laughs> this just in, you guys. Hold on. Uh, Emily's saying, everybody be honest. Okay, I got it. Okay. Breaking news. Yeah, what, what's the option? What's the alternative to being honest? What do you mean? Uh, I think a lot of people hide the truth. If you're late, simply say, I'm running late. We are, be we are behind on the schedule, but I promise you I'm going to catch up, and here's how I'm going to catch up. Rather than saying, oh, we're, it's in the mail, or like, I get this a lot. I left, I, I swear to God, I heard this just like last week. Some of my, one of my design clients told the client they left the presentation in the, in the cab, when, which is ridiculous because it's on the computer. Like, I didn't even get that excuse. Um, all I'm saying is just if you made a mistake, you should own up to it and say, here's how I'm going to fix it. If the client is misbehaving, you need to let them know they're misbehaving. I just think we need to talk to our clients more and be truthful. Like you, you know, here, here's a perfect example of my honesty. Uh, this is my favorite example. I had a client who was a designer who was in Boston. I'm not gonna name names, but who, if she's watching, she'll know who she is. Uh, and we, we get along really well for a long time, but then because the computers, this is earlier on in my relationship, we ended up doing a lot more phone calls, right? A tremendous amount of phone calls. And she was starting to be a bitch on the phone. She was just being a little bit nasty to me and short and just not who she used to be. And I, as an intern, started behaving that way as well. And I was getting really frustrated and I was ready to fire her because she was just not being nice to me. And so I called her up and I just talked to her and I said, hey, you know what? I feel like we're sort of taking each other for granted or we're treating each other badly and I'm not really happy with how we're talking to each other. And she's like, I am so glad you mentioned that. I feel the same way. And we changed how we, and we looked at how, why we were doing that. And one of the things we realized is that we were both the same person. We were both super honest and direct and right to the point. And that's not great to do on the phone. So we just agreed to do it always by Skype or by you know virtual so we can see each other. And it changed our relationship. So I actually think sometimes we have to call people on things. And I love when my clients call me on things, right? Yeah. I think it's important that we talk to each other. I think we learn that way. And I think people will change the behaviors. If we don't push back enough and we don't tell our clients why they're misbehaving or what they're doing and the consequences of their actions, they're gonna keep doing it to you and to other creatives. Emily, I'm gonna be honest sense? with you. I think you're being aggressive right now. <laughs> That's my style. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was just wanted to see how you would respond to that. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's really funny. I that's a word that, you know, obviously women really hate. Really? Because men are never called aggressive that in the same way we are when we're called that way. Yeah. Um, but I'm just a strong minded person and what's really interesting about me, and you'll find this if people work with me, I sound like I this is the answer, but I'm really open to hearing pushback. Like I want, like I do this intentionally because I want people to push back. If they hear something they don't like, then I want that pushback because I want them to land somewhere where they completely and fully believe in it. So I, I sort of like to push people's buttons. Okay. It's kind of my, it's kind of my favorite thing. 
I do too. I don't know why we get along so well. I have no idea. Hey guys, in case you're joining us, we are. There's this is truth saying. Emily's yelling at me and possibly you at the same time. <laughs> Jonah, slide please. This is no BS. She's not gonna skirt around the issue. She's gonna get right to it. She's sharing business strategies for creative businesses. So if you guys are joining us there, that's that's who we're talking to. We're talking to Emily Cohen. If you're interested in checking her out, here's some information in case you're joining us late. Go check her out at emilycohen.com. If you want to follow her on social media, it's Emily Ruth Cohen. And she's, she's sharing some things from her book, which is super awesome. Your slides almost broke my my computer because you gave me like uh, like 200 megabyte files, like the highest resolution files I've ever gotten from a guest before. And oh, tons sorry of about that. No, no, it's awesome. I love that. <laughs> I could have compressed them. I should have compressed them. I wasn't thinking. You know, I thought our internet can handle it, but apparently it can't. Okay, so let's oh, let's sorry. go back. How, how much so more do we really, have? We're almost done, and we're almost then we can done. talk almost about done. my book. Yeah, so yeah. That's good. Okay. So let's be honest, and then. And not surprisingly, I, I kind of like to embrace conflict. If there's a conflict, what? we should embrace it. I know. Surprising, right? <laughs> uh, I, I, I just think I'm a really big believer in that. Like, if there's conflict, just embrace it. It's a challenge. It's an opportunity. And don't avoid it. And this is my favorite one, and I always end with this. Mm. We should learn to say no more often. No. <laughs> I think the, the minute we say no... It feels so good. Like, have you ever fired a client? I'm sure you have. Yes. I absolutely love trying. I, I have a rule of thumb, which is you should fire one client a year. Ooh. It feels so good. <laughs> You're sick and twisted. Oh, my gosh. I only fire clients that suck. <laughs> and if I'm doing my job with position, really? then, then I don't get too many of them. Yeah. But I just like, we, we need to like, if you, there's this magic word, where we just say no, yeah. and just say no like that, just no, people will be like, whoa, okay, what is it? And then you can explain it. A lot of times we, we kind of formulate our no by like, no, sorry, or, or no, because of this. First start with just no, then breathe, and then explain. It has a lot of power. And it's not a bad word. It really isn't. Sometimes clients just need to hear that. And again, I'm going to go back to the dogs and kids thing, right? You need to say no to dogs and kids, just like you do to clients. Very interesting. So, Very interesting. Yeah. Have you grown so up? So that's like kind of like, those are some behaviors I think we should be starting to practice. And I think as a result, clients will behave better. Obviously, there's no perfect answer. There's going to be asshole clients. And those are the clients we say no to. Okay. Have you always been comfortable saying no to people? Yes, my entire life. I so, was raised that way. So I was raised very by a very strong-minded people. I bet. I and bet. I raised my, my kids like that, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to raise my clients like that. So what happens when you're like, kids, go to bed? No. Well, my kids are old now, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're doing now, but they're 25 <laughs> and 23, so they're, okay. you know... They're, but they're comfortable saying no. Okay. All right. Let's say you and I are working together and I've hired you for a project before and it went great and I paid you and everything's awesome. Second project's come in and then you don't like me anymore. You want to fire me. Emily, can you fire me, please? So, so you want me to fire a client? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, you should have warned them a little bit. The best way to do it is to say, you know what? I think we've outgrown each other. I might be too expensive for you, for you and I think you might want to move on to somebody else and here's somebody else you should move on to. What if or, I can pay you more? Is that if what? you can pay you and they're being a misbehaving client, you can say, you know, I want to finish this project, but I think after this, I think our relationship sort of at its end because I just don't kind of work with clients that misbehave like this. Or you might just say, this is the point of the communicating. They should already know they're misbehaving. If you're all surprising them with this, I don't recommend you do this. You really need to communicate throughout this. And so the end of it would might be if they come back, I would not fire them after you've delivered something. Typically, I wait till they come back to you and you can say, you know, actually, you could, this is going back to the honesty thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a little caveat to that. You might want to say, I'm just too busy. The challenge with that is then they will think you're too busy and tell everybody else. So I'd rather them be, be I'd rather you be honest and say, you know what? I originally loved working with you, but our relationship has sort of deteriorated in terms of this, these three, three things have happened. And I just don't feel comfortable that I'm the best firm for, for you, for the kind of uh, project or the kind of relationship you need. I like that. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> What's YouTube? Crazy. You guys can rewind, but yes, can you say it one more time? I want to listen. Real, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to say, I loved working with you initially, or, you know, initially the relationship seemed really great, but as you know from my, how I've communicated, there's some problems that have happened over the course of the relationship that was making it very frustrating to work, and I don't know if I'm the right fit for you at this point, and you might be better served by another firm that can help can handle that kind of behavior or is more used to that or something like that. I think you just have to call them on their behavior, say you're not the right firm and recommend that they move on. Um, honestly, it's just being, you know, more like I tell people why you're moving on. I try not to use excuses, but I'm too busy or I typically like to say I'm too expensive, even if you're not, <laughs> because if they pay you, let's say, I don't know, whatever, crazy amount of money. Let's say they give you $200,000 for a logo and they're still an asshole client. Maybe they'll give you 300,000 and then maybe it's worth working with them. So sometimes you get more money from those clients that you try to hire. And sometimes clients come back. So I had a client that was an alcoholic um, and I had to call him on it. And I, the way I said it was, I think alcohol is a big influence on your culture. <laughs> Wow, that's a nice way to say that. Like, yeah, and I said, when you're when that's not such an influencer, I would love to work with you again. And he came back two years later and said, hey, you know, what you said to me was so mean. And I was so angry, but it made it was a sort of like in my brain and eventually made me go to Al Alcoholics Anonymous. And two years later, it came and worked with me. Um, it was really interesting. So I think, and Did I've seen my clients. Out? Yeah. It was great oh, wow. for a really long time. Look at you, Miss um, Tuffle. He was, I mean, it was really weird. He had, his project manager was his ex-bartender. <laughs> they had happy hour wow. at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. So alcohol was like a huge driver in the culture. I just, um, like I drank myself, but I was not comfortable with that level of drinking. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, I've done that. I've used my own tools for my clients. Our online community is saying the second time you did it, it was even better than the first time. So thank you for doing that, Emily. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I love doing this. This is like my favorite thing, solving people's problems. This is oh, I thought you were going to say I love firing people. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have so many favorite things. I love firing people. I like conflict. I like solving problems. Saying no. Wow. Okay, guys, if you need help with that, you can reach out to Emily Cohen. She's at emilycohen.com. Okay, is that the last slide yep that was it now okay. we can talk about the book you, you want to talk about stuff so oh, yeah i, I, I want to like you guys i want to reward everybody for for sticking it out with us for this long because it, it might get a little juicy right now i'm just saying we're going off script i want to talk to emily about her book and i look at it and it's like there are not that many design books that are business related that i look at and think you know what that's a better book yeah i Thank think you. this is one of those instances that i'm like dang it <laughs> all right so the book retails for $38. Somebody said it's $55 on Amazon. Uh, but oh, I that's, think, yeah, it's used. Yes. So they, can they buy this directly from you? Yes. So they can buy it. Um, so it's interesting. It's a self-published book. It's mostly available through me. Um, or there are some bookstores in Toronto, LA, and New York that sell it. But not a lot. So mostly through me. Yes. And, and with that note, I just want to say thank you for sending me your copy. Appreciate oh, that. you're welcome. Okay. So this book costs a lot of money. There's decisions yes. that you made here that really added to the bottom line. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? I would. I'd okay. love to talk about Go that. Ahead. So uh, I look, I am friends with all my colleagues. We're all friends, right? I think we all, so you're speaking to David Baker tomorrow. He's my competitor and a colleague. Yes. You know, we're all really good friends. And a lot of my colleagues have written fantastic, really smart books. You should read them all. What I found was not was missing was that business books that did a few things. One spoke the language that would relate to creatives. Creatives are not all readers. They really need visuals to communicate to them. They need color, they need beautiful design. Can I just interrupt and you I for found, a second? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this just in creatives designers don't <laughs> like to read. Okay, yeah. guys, be honest. <laughs> You don't like to read. So Emily has to trick you into reading. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's exactly it. I mean, look, you didn't read it, right? You looked at the pretty pictures. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I want to set the record straight. I actually love to read. I probably own yeah. more, more books than, than any designer I know. Yeah, I, I know probably, you do. I, I know. have thousands of books, okay? So the problem is there's a, a little side table next to me. 
and there's three stacks, literally three stacks, about 10 yeah. books high of books I need to read. And I'm like, oh, I got another book. And as soon as somebody tells me to buy a book, I just buy it. And it, so yes. it's like an avalanche of books. It's just a matter of, yeah. you know, when am I going to get to read it? That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good point. I shouldn't have said that. No, it's okay. There are some designers who don't like reading. The ones that do, um, they want, I find that I wanted to make sure that I resonated with them and got right to the point. So I wanted a book that really had, if they just wanted to scan the book, they would learn something. Um, and I just wanted to speak their language. I wanted to show them that I understood design, even though I don't know the font. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Helvetica. No, I don't know. I can. I'll. I'll let you know, and you can add it to the, the live stream. Okay. If you want, but, the typography uh, sleuths, look at this. I mean, it kind of feels like Helvetica, you guys. Yeah. I can right now. I'm going to text. Yeah, I tried to look inside. She, you know, she was the project manager. Yeah, get her on the phone right let now. Me, let me ask her. Come on, this is unacceptable. I'm going to answer. And inquiring what design is, minds want to know. Oh, it's probably not because the dot, um, what is that called? The tittle? The little dot above the eye? Yeah. It, it's a round dot, unless this is an alternative version of Helvetica. Helvetica now allows you to do that, but I don't think Helvetica now was out when this book Well, I'm was. asking my project manager, who is my daughter. She'll get back to us. We'll have it by the end of the live stream. <laughs> chop, chop. Come on, let's get... Where's that team? Come on. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted this book. I wanted to spend money on it so that people would read it. It would, they would learn something from it. They could scan it. And what this also, I don't know if you noticed about the book, there's case studies from actual creatives in there. So I included the voice of my clients in there. And so there's real examples of how people have implemented some of the recommendations and created great ideas themselves. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about how much the book yeah. costs. How much does this book cost you to make? It's self-published, guys. You're going to be shocked. When I asked Emily how much yeah. it costs to print this book, the first answer she gave me was $1.50. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> we need to call your printer right now because our book costs more and it's like less. And her book sells for $38. So $1.50, she's making the money. And then she's like, wait, wait, yeah. let me look this up. Tell us now how much it costs you just to print this book. <laughs> yeah, make me look like an idiot. I'm not very good with that kind of stuff. I like my memory. Sometimes I like to write notes down and sometimes I have to refer back. And so once I did refer back, I was like, oh, wait, it was nowhere close to that. It was around $26, $27 a book. Oh, my it God. It was nine. It's nine pianos colors. It has smite binding, which makes it its sewn binding. So it lets it sit flat. Um, it has varnish on the outside. It was very expensive to produce and i paid for the fonts i you know obviously i wanted to do this completely ethically i paid for the designer so i paid them a full fee i did not do any bartering with that um that's really important because that's why the price kept increasing um and but printers and and the paper company mohawk oh the other things i use gorgeous mohawk super fine paper which is very expensive but absolutely gorgeous and the first thing people say when they see that book besides the color is how they love the paper and I really wanted to make sure that people love the book. That okay. design. I wanted it to be for my audience. So I, doctor, yeah, I don't know if it was a stupid decision. Yes, doctor, I have a question to ask you. <laughs> yeah. So you teach the business of design. I don't know many people who do that to creatives. The business of design to creatives, and you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. If one of your students said to you, I got this project, <laughs> I'm going to go nuts because it's got to be the most <laughs> premium experience ever. Yeah. Doctor, what are you going to say to this person? Yeah. You're stupid. Don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, probably what I, I did it for a reason. I like, I'm not, I didn't do it willy nilly. I did it because I wanted, I knew I wasn't going to make money. I didn't want to lose money. So I'm not losing money. I'm not, this is not a profit margin. This is not a profitable endeavor for me. I did it for, for reasons. So if you're doing it with intent, right, we all do work for nonprofits and for good with intent. This is sort of my contribution. I felt like there were a lot of people that couldn't afford to work with me or were too small to work with me, like one person firms um, that could benefit from my knowledge. And I wanted to share that love and share that knowledge with a larger audience because I think we were doing things as an industry that were misbehaving. I'm getting serious now. Um, and I wanted to share that knowledge. So I did that one to share the knowledge. And the other thing, and you and I talked about this beforehand. Um, I have been a speaker for 30 years. And I've always been, the business of design has been relegated a lot of times to breakout sessions or workshops. And I was getting really, uh, there was very few main stage speakers that were talking about business of design, except men, first of all, so one of them being you, and the other one being David Baker. Um, and I was always somewhere behind that, even though I've been in the industry 30 years. This book, 
I did that with intent so that I would be able to be more considered an expert, even though, which was ridiculous, I was an expert, um, so that I can get main stage talks. So it, it did, ben I did benefit from it and I've gotten a lot more speaking engagement from it. So I think in the end, there's a value from it because I did get clients from it. Um, so I did benefit in other ways. So if you're gonna do something, there should be some reason. It, it doesn't always have to be money. Right, okay, I love that. And maybe I'm a little stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get back to this whole male female stage thing and it bothers me. Okay. It doesn't feel right, but I want to get back to that. I want to stay on this topic. Okay, here. wait. I know the fonts. Hold on. I know the what fonts. What is it? Should we drum roll. That? I don't have a David, drum roll. David is one of the fonts and Mercury text. Oh. That was kind of there anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Two fonts I've never heard of before. David and then what's the other one? Mercury text. Mercury text. I assume that's a serif one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. One is from Hoffler. Oh. Hoffler. Hoffler. Yeah, Hoffler. And Jonathan Hoffler. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll have to check and that the out. The other one is from this independent design type designer. Now I wish I used my own. I have, I have a few type design clients, and I wish I used their fonts. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's get back to this whole thing. You you get this idea in your head. You want to make this thing. It's full of love, and you have this intention. You have all these these stories you tell yourself about why you make the book. And I have yet to meet a creative person who hasn't as equally convinced of their own story that this is why they need to go and do more than what they're being paid for or to go nuts on a business card that costs them $3 to do that. I'm like right. if you if you spend $3 on a business card, it, kind of an antiquated way of exchanging information, but they're like right. no no no, it's premium and it's going to be different. They're going to save this card. Yeah. You, you know how much new business I'm going to get from this. I, I say to them, Zero. why don't you just hand them $3 in cash and just yeah. stamp your name on it. It's more memorable than that. Yeah. Go yeah. buy yourself a drink. Boom, here's my number. Yeah. I completely agree. Matt, okay. I'm going to take that one <laughs> step further. Yeah. What I hate about when designers do is they, instead of doing new business, they design some fancy thing that's kind of expensive to produce to hand out to people. Like you, they spend a lot of time designing fancy things that don't get them like a wine label. Yeah, but this gets me things, this results. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not> here. <laughs> there was a reason why I did that and uh -huh. it was to educate people and to get new clients and to get speaking, right? And I, all of those things happen. You know, the um, irony is a little But designing thick. a pencil or designing like a wine bottle, <laughs> it doesn't really, and I ask my clients, like, can you call me a business? Yeah. No. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just my thing. All right, hashtag I mean, irony. If it's cheap I to produce, it. like, a branded hat, say. Yeah. I know somebody wears branded hats. I do. That's worth it. Right? Yeah, but this only cost me a few bucks to make. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, that's your thing, right? I have always seen you speak with a hat. That's my earrings. Yes. That's right. So when I'm wearing the Versace hat, you guys, you know, okay, I had intention. <laughs> there was a reason yeah. I needed to do it. Okay, we'll move yeah, on from that. It's your brand. So look, I, I, I produced a book and I was trying to be a good business person because I want to practice what I preach. And yeah. the book costs us only a few dollars to make. And we, we put in, you know, the matte paper, the soft touch and the hot stamp and the Pantone colors too. We yeah. did the whole bit, but we, we wanted to be very disciplined because at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure your book is just as good to the person reading it using two PMS colors. Yeah. You know, it's well, still brilliant. It's still beautiful. Yeah. I would sort of disagree with you. I think oh, yeah? that it got a lot of buzz because of the colors. I think it got a lot more press than other books did. Um, and I sold a lot for a self-publisher. I've already sold at least uh, close to 4,000 books. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think that's pretty damn good. So I'm very happy with what I did. I, I know it was expensive. It didn't, like in other words, I... Yeah, I lost a little money, but I was fine with that. <laughs> no, I was fine well, okay. with that. I, okay, I, made, so I made a judgment call. I think I, we all I get do you. that. Okay. Yeah. I won't harass you anymore on this. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just pointing yeah. some things out. Let's get yeah. into this whole thing. Like, um, a book is actually a very good business card, if you think about it. And a lot yeah. of people do approach it that way, that they can put all their thoughts down to edit it, to design it, to make it exactly what they want so they don't have to repeat themselves. And for a lot of people, having a book is an entryway into a certain echelon of creative thinker that once it's in print, you f you get this thing like you're more legitimate for whatever reason. Yes, I'm gonna get completely. That, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you said yeah. that uh, for a number of different reasons, you weren't on main stage talking about the old yeah. boring topic of how to make money. Like who would want to hear that, right? Yeah. Okay. And then you, you do the book and then all of a sudden you're on main stage doing this thing. So yeah. 
you find some correlation between the book and on the main stage. But yes. I want to just open this topic up, guys. It's going to get a little hot right now. Is why are men treated differently than women in, in terms of conferences and the prestige that they get or the slots? Yeah. What's going on? It's a really good question. I have no damn idea. Um, sexism. Um, I think it's inherent sexism. I think men command men. No, I shouldn't say this. Um, I don't know what it is other than sexism. I'm actually completely baffled by it because I've been in the industry for 30 years and I have been speaking and I'm a damn good speaker and I'm pretty smart, so I'm surprised. I don't know what it is. Honestly, I think just sexism and, and just un, unbiased or un, not, like what's the word? Um, when they don't know they're being sexist. That's the word for that. It's like um, institutional sexism or yeah. something? Yeah, and I don't, Part of it's the topic. I will be honest. I think business is now hot when it once wasn't hot. Now it's important because people are realizing, hey, I should be making money. I should be practicing better. So I think business is a little bit of a hotter topic. But I did find that men just got more main stage speak talks than I did. And they command higher fees. And people are willing to pay men more. And women, I think, and I'm not one of those women, but women do do things like contribute where the, we, there's that... Um, we have a lack of confidence in ourselves. Um, we express that through where we're pricing. There's the confidence gap. You know about the confidence gap? No. So there's a proven thing called the confidence gap, which is that women, in order for women to ask for anything or to, to communicate anything, uh, especially about raises, we have to be 100% confident that we deserve it. Yep. Men can be at least 60% confident and they still can ask for the same raise. Um, oh. So there is this confidence gap that in, inhibits women from succeeding a little bit. I don't have that. I'm super confident. Uh, but I think there are women <laughs> that contribute to that. But I yeah. do think it's mostly inherent sexism, institutionalized sexism um, that people are trying to overcome, but it still exists. And I hate seeing that. I really do. Mm. Um, and I've, I've definitely been, I was one of the first female speakers. Actually, when I first started speaking, there weren't that many women speakers at all. Now there are, which is great, but not enough. And certainly not enough people of color. I have a whole issue about diversity, which everybody is doing right now. Yeah, I, I think, think there, need, are, yeah. there are a couple of woke people who insist, and they're, they're part of the, I think, the whale, uh, I'm sorry, the white male majority who are saying, I'm not going to come on and, uh, and, and agree to speak unless you do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And they're making yeah. a case for it. But I want to talk a little bit about the confidence gap. I, I, I now know the concept. I just didn't know that that's what it was called. So yeah. am I super twisted that I feel like I only need 15% of the skill to feel like I can do it? Because <laughs> you said 60%. Yeah. I'm like, did you say 60 or 16? I'm, 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 yeah, I'm ready 60, to go. 60. I mean, I don't know the actual numbers, but yeah. there's some. it's a huge difference between yes. what women can ask for in terms of salaries and, and anything, promotion, than men. Yeah. So the the natural response that some people will say to this is that then you're just a fraud. If you don't feel, if you don't, if you can't deliver 100% of everything you say you're going to, then you're a fraud. How do you wrestle with that? Well, I think it's not, it's deeper than that. And this could be a whole longer conversation um, because men are raised differently than women are raised. We communicate differently. We have our expectations. There are words that are used to describe men versus women that are different. So I think there's a lot of lot of things that are going on there. I don't think it's, I never blame anybody. Well, sometimes I do, but mostly I don't blame people. I think it's just, it's how we, how we have culturalized, institutionalized to believe this stuff and we have to fight it every single time. Okay. Yeah. So I want to use this platform for something here. Oh, right. Go ahead. I, I don't think there are good men speakers and good women speakers. There's just good oh. and bad speakers, period. Sometimes they're men, sometimes they're women, period. Right. And okay. people like you and me and other people who aspire to do public speaking, we work really hard at this. And sometimes it's hard for the event organizer to figure out the good ones from the ones that kind of phone it in. And there's a lot of people who do that. And then we sit there and say, well, why are we relegated to the back room or the side yeah. halls when we should be on the main stage? Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the platform. What would you say yeah. to those event organizers right now? Because we can maybe start the dialogue and I just want to turn it over to you. I would like to say, first of all, there's not enough women speakers and people of color speaking. So we need to take a chance with new speakers too, first of all. Um, I think that conference organizers need to take a little bit more of a risk with new speakers and groom them. When I first started speaking, I, like I said, I was the first woman speaker. And um, how the how conference, Bryn um, Muth took a, took a chance with me. I'd never spoken in my life and she put me right up there and had me speak. And 
you know, my first time wasn't so great. I got better over time. So I think a little bit of it is we have to look at conference organizers have to look at their roster and make sure that there's good diversity in terms of equal mix of men and women, equal mix of color. Um, and then if we can't find them, we have to look harder. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to say something here and uh, I have my own way of solving this problem. Yeah. And I think this, it's like, we want the conference organizers to take risk, but we're not risk tolerant ourselves. So we got to make sure that we make it the least risky thing to book Emily Cohen or to book Chris Doe or whoever else is out there. And the way I look at that is, um, and this might sound like I'm, I'm bringing up my ego here, but I've worked really hard at developing an audience, a relationship of giving value uh, without expectations that in, in at some point when I go and speak somewhere, people will show up to do that. I, I recently got back from uh, awards in Amsterdam and uh, the founder of the organization told me that he bumped into several people who told me, who told him they just showed up because they heard that I was going to be there. So we could all do that. We could take some of the burden and the risk away from the event organizers because truth be told, there are some terrible speakers out there. I won't name any names, but I go to these conferences and I'm like, oh my God, where's yeah. the exit? This is so bad. And if it wasn't like 30 people blocking me from the exit, I would get up right now because you're not even respecting my time. You got to work on this. So they want to do what's easy. And this is not uh, anything bad against them because they want to bring in the big names, the people who have written books, Emily Cohen. The people right. who have spoken and they can watch their videos who command an audience who have a big social following just make it easier so if you're a person of color uh if you're a part of the lgbt q community uh you just need to be just be known so that they can't ignore you and i don't expect personally i don't expect anybody to take that risk i will take the risk i will put in the work and so we can do right. that and you've done that you've designed a beautiful book full yeah. of your wisdom from the last 30 years and yeah, I <laughs> no, I, I sort of agree with you, Okay, but well, I, I don't think it's the burden on us also. Like, I think okay. you agree that because I'm not like a social media darling like you are. Like, honestly, I, <laughs> you know, like maybe I do have the, like, maybe that's your, your book. In other words, like you're probably putting a lot of money, your personal money yes. into that. Oh, true. So you are doing something similar, right? Um, so for me, it was the book. I'm not a big, like, I'm not going to be podcasting. I'm, I'm not going to, I don't really care about how many followers I have. Um, I just know that I'm an expert and I have value and people should have me and speak because of that. And I don't want to, I don't need to prove that. I really don't. Um, I can make it easier because I obviously want to attract. So I agree with the social media following that it helps get, and more and more conferences are looking for social media followers simply because they need to attract people to their events. So I agree with that a little bit. Um, so I'm definitely on social media and I'm very engaged on social media, but I'm not really and I thought maybe I should look for more and more and more followers. I like to have followers that I know and, and know me really well. Yeah. Um, but I get that. I, I just don't want to feel like the burden's always on the speakers because I think there are people that are not as well known that are so talented, that are working in smaller markets or that are from other communities that maybe are not as well known, like Native Americans um, or, you know, L LGBTQT, whatever. I forgot what was, sorry about that. Um, there are people that are just not don't have the opportunity like you have to build that social following um, that are still doing great work and are great speakers. Well, but I do think people should feel more comfortable speaking. I think women in general don't feel as comfortable speaking um, and women and men need to start knowing that they can speak. And I think that's one of the things most of my clients have fear of public speaking. And yes. we need to get over that. Okay. So I want to, oh my gosh, it's, it's getting hot, but we probably need to wrap up the show pretty soon here. So yeah. let's, let's see if uh, we can do a couple of things before I wrap the show here. Uh, would you agree with this statement that people hire people they know, like, and trust? Absolutely. 100%. Okay. So the first part, and I talk about this all the time. Well, you got to get known, man. You got to go yeah. put yourself out there. It's not any different if you want to be a speaker, a designer, you want clients. You got to work on that. And especially today, the game has changed drastically. It really has where you have a direct connection with your audience. And I know right. that the idea of having followers sounds terrible. I don't want a follower. I'm trying to build a community, people who have yeah. shared interests, beliefs, and values that I do, and I'm gonna yeah. give generously. And like I said, if I do that, if I do my part and show up every single day, they might show up too. And I think yeah. that's just important in terms of the new marketing, the relationship built marketing, okay? Yeah. I wanna say that. I completely agree with that. Okay. I agree with that. I think what I, I just think there's different ways of doing it. It might not be social media, it might be, you know, 
speaking or it might be like I'm active in the AIJ. I think there's different yes. ways we can all do that. And also I'm much more of a one-to-one person. I love relationships one-to-one. Yeah. And I, I also have to say this, uh, there's a good reason why you're on the show and why not, a lot of other people aren't on, on, on the show, because what we realize over time is I invite people that are, are diverse and are, that I think are interesting, that do cool things. And I get them on the show and they're just not interesting at all. Yeah. And so now we've made this rule. We have to be a lot harder in terms of vetting who gets on the show. So we yes. gravitate towards people who do public speaking, who've yes. given a presentation or have written a book. It's no yes. surprise you're on today and David Baker, who's written many books, will be on tomorrow. Yes. That's yes. the bottom David, line. And David Baker is awesome. So by yes. the way, that's a little I mean, you have, to be, uh, you have to be good at articulating your thoughts, either in written form, in podcasts, in, in yes. public presentations. You got to be able to do that so that we know, because I don't want to kill our audience. Every time they show up and somebody doesn't sh give value, uh, a little bit of our brand is diminished, right? So yeah. having said that, that's it. And you've done a wonderful job with this book. Again, guys, I, I, I probably promoted this book more than I've ever promoted any book that I've ever <laughs> uh, had here. So you guys can go to emilycohen.com and you can pick up a copy of the book. It's probably more uh, affordable to buy directly from her and you're supporting the artist in that way. It's 38 bucks, guys. It's called No, I can't say it, No BS Business Strategies to Evolve Your Creative Business by Emily Cohen. I'm gonna do the show wrap up right now. Is that okay? That's great. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, okay. My pleasure. And thanks for doing this. Okay. Oh, Here wait, we go. I can't, I can't be remiss by not saying, please follow me because apparently I need more followers. <laughs> oh, I will, I will help. I will help for sure. Okay. <laughs> Being the social media darling that I am, you know, I'm not guys. I say that with tongue in cheek guys, please. please. Okay. Here we go. Here we go, Jonna. So positioning, uh, there's a lot of different ways to understand this, but you need to know who you are, what you want from your life, your beliefs and your values. And before you start looking at what kind of clients that you want. The little story that we talked about is that exchange of gifts, it's a value exchange. They give you money, you give them something. Be clear about what it is that you give them and who they are. And I love this idea from Emily, have quarterly creative summits to be proactive with your relationships with your client. And this allows you to, to identify undiscovered opportunities and deliver greater value. Don't wait for them to call you, just schedule it, charge money for it. Start to be seen as somebody that brings a lot of value and is thinking about their business. I also love this, the red flag rule, where every red flag you recognize add 10% to your estimate. I love that. That's so fresh, it's something that you can apply today. So if they're too slow in speaking for Emily or over, overly verbose, <laughs> they just use too many words and they're just gonna chew up all your time, add 10% to the estimate. If you're not talking to the decision maker, and oftentimes you're not, charge more because there's more people making decisions that you can't see in the room. And especially if there are too many stakeholders, aka too many cooks in the kitchen, charge more. So if you recognize these three things, add a 30% tax because you're going to pay for it one way or the other and you're going to thank Emily for it, okay? <laughs> and you're going to do that by buying her book, okay? Now, if you get hit with this and you need to recognize this, the work for hire, which, you know, there's, there's, a, there's some grade to this, just be careful what you're agreeing to because what it means is the client owns the work product. So whatever you deliver to them, they own and they can use for whatever they want. If that's gonna happen, just make sure you charge a lot of money for it, and a lot is relative to you, and that's okay. And she has creative ways to respond to people who stipulate in their contract, you cannot show this work. Sometimes it's called an NDA, sometimes it's more complicated, but negotiate. Life is a negotiation, so don't be afraid to push back and say, well, is it okay if I show portions of it? Snippets, 30-second uh, cutdowns, something shorter, can I do that? Can there be an expiration date to this? Meaning, uh, one year after it goes public, can I show the work then? And the last, but the most secure way to do this is, can I submit it to your team for approval that they could read the copy, the press release, and make sure everybody's okay? And that also gets you off the hook for, for being sued later on. And I love this. I think Emily's very firm, but she's saying do it with empathy. And that's uh, the dance that we're gonna have to, to deal with. Most of us are very empathetic people pleasers. We got to work on firming up that kind of backbone and learning how to say no. And lastly, of <laughs> course, she's like, be honest. And, and that seems like, what? Of course, I'm always honest. But there's a level of transparency that you want to communicate to your client. If you're not feeling the relationship, let them know. Be professional. Don't call names, but be honest to what's going on and don't just uh, skirt around or uh, with an excuse or some other made up reason because sometimes you get called on it. And the real miraculous thing here is, Almost all problems get better 
when they put more money in front of you. So if you don't like the client, they're like, let's quadruple your fees. You're like, nah, I like you a lot better now. You must respect me or something, okay? Here we go. Uh, before we say goodbye to Emily, here's how you get in touch with her. It's emilycohen.com, Emily Ruth Cohen on social media. Guys, go follow right now. I know there's at least 500 of you guys watching this live. So if you've gotten any semblance of value from this hour and a half long conversation, go follow her. Do it right now. Do it on Twitter. <laughs> Are you also on Instagram? Yes. Okay. So Twitter, yes. Instagram, follow her on LinkedIn. She teaches courses on lynda.com, aka LinkedIn Learning. That's it, guys. I'm going to say farewell. Emily, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It was great meeting you, and really, I hope we stay in touch. And, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <Keep going. laughs>